Good morning, friends, and welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Seventh Avenue Church in Sacramento, California. Very warm welcome to our online members and those who are joining us on the various television networks to study our lesson today. Also, I'd like to welcome our regular church members and our visitors here at Granite Bay. Always nice to see you folks coming out Sabbath morning to study with us. And we're finishing up our lesson quarterly in the book of Acts this morning. We're actually on lesson number 13. That's entitled Journey to Rome. So today's the last Sabbath we're studying out of this book. But starting next week, we start a brand new lesson quarterly entitled Oneness in Christ. And I know for those of you here locally, hopefully you've all received the lesson quarterly. If you have not yet received one, they are available in the church foyer, and you'll be able to pick one up as you leave. For our friends who are watching online, if you'd like to get the lesson for next week, you can do so by just simply downloading the lesson at the following website, study.aftv.org. Again, that uh, website is study.aftv.org, and you can download lesson number one of our new lesson quarterly, and you can study and prepare for next week. We do have a free offer we'd like to let our friends know about. It is a sermon DVD, and we'll be happy to send that out to anybody who calls and asks. The number is 866-788-3966, and you can ask for offer number 829, or you can download a digital version of the sermon by texting the following code SH105 to the number 40544. And you'll get a link and you'll be able to download the sermon, The Dangers of a Diluted Gospel. And I think you'll find that inspiring and encouraging. Well, at this time, we'd like to invite our song leaders to come and they'll lead us as we lift our voices in song.
Thank you so much for singing along with us. And at this time, Pastor Ross will have our opening prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the opportunity to uh, open up your word and study. And as we look at the life of Paul, as we finish up our study in uh, Paul's ministry, we just ask once again that the Holy Spirit would come and guide our hearts and may we be inspired by just his commitment to you and to the work of taking the gospel to as many as he could. May that uh, inspire us in our realms, in our spheres of influence, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson today is going to be brought to us by Pastor Doug. I'm excited about our lesson. We're doing our last lesson, as Pastor Ross mentioned. And in case some joined us late, I also want to remind you that uh, next week we're going to be doing lesson number one, Oneness in Christ is our new quarter's theme. And I'm looking forward to that. For those who are members of our local church here, we have some copies of this out there in the foyer for you to pick up later. I, you know, when I realized we'd be doing the book of Acts, I actually thumbed ahead and wanted to make sure I travel sometimes and I'm here some weeks and I'm gone other weeks. I wanted to be here this week because this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts. It's about a storm at sea. And um, I like the sea. Um, it's, it, and I like it even when it gets a little rough. It's kind of fun. You don't want it to get too rough, then it gets scary. But uh, I, twice I've lived on sailboats. Um, when I grew up in Florida, I had a sailboat in the backyard. And so I kind of understood the, the basics of sailing when I was about 12 years old. It, it was just a little sailboat. I, I've capsized my sailboat about 100 times. So it was fun to wreck it. I'd take my girlfriends out and I'd capsize it and I'd act like it was an accident. <laughs> But it was a little sunfish sailboat. I don't know if any of you remember those. And there was a way you could stand on the keel and you could flip it back over out in the middle of Biscayne Bay. But um, I lived on a boat in the Mediterranean. Uh, my dad sent me to a summer camp where we lived on a sailboat briefly in uh, the Florida Keys. And uh, so I just love the stories of the sea. And uh, just got done reading another uh, true story. I like some of the true histories about the stories of the sea. I'm one of the few people the red, all of Moby Dick. Any of you get assigned to read Moby Dick when you were in college? Now, a lot of you went to Christian colleges, so you, you, they probably didn't assign that. But um, this is a real adventure of a story of a storm at sea. So turn in your Bibles. Our mission today is to cover Acts chapter 27 and 28. Uh, we have a memory verse, and the memory verse comes to us from Acts 27 verse 24. And I'll invite you to say that with me. I'm going to read the whole verse. I think the memory verse in your lesson just gives half of it. We'll read the whole verse in Acts 27, 24, New King James Version. You ready? Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Now, Paul had a real desire to go to Rome. He says that. I want to go to Rome. Why was it so important for Paul to go to Rome? Um, Amazing Facts was really excited when we were invited to do an evangelistic meeting in 1999 in New York City. Why do you think we were excited about that? Wasn't the biggest baptism we ever had. I think there were 60 or 70 baptized. The city's got 8 million people, so it's, you know, comparatively small. But New York is sort of the crossroads of the world. It's the financial capital of the world. It's the advertising capital of the world. Uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of people's attention. Uh, when enemies wanted to attack America, where they chose to attack? In addition to Washington, D.C., they attacked New York City. It's a very visible place. Uh, and because it is a communications capital of the world, uh, we knew if we could preach the gospel there that it would get very wide distribution and attention. And it did. And as I travel, I, I need to be honest with you, of all the different programs Amazing Facts has been connected to, we hear of more people that were baptized from the Millennium of Prophecy Net New York program, Net 99, than anything we did because it was broadcast by the church around the world and different churches picked it up and just something about being at the crossroads. Well, for Paul's day, all roads lead where? To Rome. 
It was these, you know, we got the internet today. Well, that was the internet. It all went through Rome. Paul thought, look, if I can plant the gospel seed there, if we can get a good church there, people from all over the world go through and in Rome. Why did God pour out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Acts chapter 2. For those who maybe weren't there when we covered that. Yeah. It tells you there in the chapter, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews from out of every nation under heaven. From all over the Roman Empire, they descended on Jerusalem during Pentecost. He preached, the Holy Spirit poured out and all the disciples preached, then they fanned out from that location around the Roman Empire. And so it was, the idea was to disperse the gospel. Paul knew if I could just get the church rooted strongly in Rome, now there already was a church in Rome, but Paul hadn't really been there yet. It was there because of some of the Jews at Pentecost that went back and some of the other workers. He wanted to really help stabilize the church at Rome and he knew from there it was going to go to England, it was going to go up to Germany, it would go to Spain, because it would go to North Africa, because the Romans had um, trading in all those places. So God told him, Paul, you're going you're gonna to go preach in Rome. He didn't think it was going to mean as a prisoner through a prison. <laughs> so finally, we've read about his trials. He appeals to Caesar. They said, to Caesar, you've appealed. To Caesar, you'll go. Now the journey begins. And so Paul gets on a ship that is sailing to Rome. And so join me in Acts chapter 27. And again, this last uh, lesson covers 27, 28. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. You know, when you read, uh, the Bible doesn't have good things to say about all the Roman soldiers. Some were very cruel to Jesus. But the Bible has nothing bad to say about centurions. Centurions typically were people who had been voted into a position by the other soldiers in order for you to be a centurion. And usually had a hundred men on you roughly. That's where you get a century, a hundred. Um, all the centurions in the Bible that are mentioned are typically good. Centurion at the cross that said truly this was the Son of God. The centurion that said he had faith in Jesus if he would heal his servant. The centurion that uh, Cornelius who is converted. And you've got here another centurion named Julius who is fairly good to Paul along the way. So he's delivered to him and many other prisoners. Now you read on here you'll find out there's how many prisoners? Who knows? 276 prisoners are traveling to Rome to be tried. And Paul spends quite a while in Rome waiting for his trial because Nero's court was backed up. Uh, he was sort of the supreme court. And you can read that God took advantage of that idle time waiting for trial to preach the gospel around Rome. Now just as a little amazing fact I thought I'd throw in, when Columbus came to America with the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, how many total men were there on those three ships? Check your American history. Uh, none of you are going to qualify as citizens. <laughs> there are 88 men, about 18 on the two smaller vessels and the rest on the Santa Maria. Um, how long were they? Uh, 50 feet, 60 feet, 90 feet, then Santa Maria, they were, and, and that was a barge, and they went very slowly. Do you know that the Romans had ships in the Mediterranean that were 10 times bigger? They discovered back in, they were going to be building an area that later turned into the uh, Leonardo da Vinci airport in Rome by the Tiber River, and as they were dredging there, they dug up an ancient Roman ship and it was known as Caligula's giant ship. And I think they're going to put that up on the screen there. Why did you make the picture so small? Anyway, I wanted the ship big. But that's a statue of Caligula in the back. This ship was uh, 341 feet. The beam of it, the width, 66 feet. It was wider than, uh, than two of Columbus's ships were long. It had uh, marble tile baths, hot and cold running water, and I don't know if it was run, running, that hot and cold water. It was a palace ship that he would float around and have parties on. 
It was one of two that was found, and they were excavating it. World War II broke out, and it was destroyed in the bombing around Rome, which is kind of sad, and they were burned. But um, they had some big vessels back then. You know, they, they used to argue it was impossible to build Noah's Ark because no wooden ship could be that big could withstand it, and that was just an urban myth. So here, they're on, it probably wasn't as big as Caligula's ship, but they're on a big Phoenician trader. 276 people are on this ship, and uh, they need to get them to Rome. They make some stops along the way. Not everyone is a prisoner. There's some cargo that they're selling. But you read in verse 3, it says, The next day we landed in Zidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go see his friends and to receive care. He kind of lets him go on his own recognizance and um, says, you know, you've got to be back before we depart. Now, in the Roman Empire, it was very hard to run away and not be known. Romans, they had papers. Um, you always had to give an account. Soldiers were stationed everywhere, and you had to be able to give an account of who you were and where you go. So unless you planned that just running off in the hills and hiding, you couldn't really escape. And the Paul had given his word, and they knew he was a man they could trust. You jump down in verse 8, and as they're going from port to port, they're trying to make their way to Rome. It says, We sailed slowly many days, and we arrived with difficulty at Sindus, the wind not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of Crete. You know what it means to be in the doldrums? You ever heard the expression, being in the doldrums? We use it to talk about being depressed. Oh, they're kind of in the doldrums. It's because the ancient ships would be sailing off North Africa, and there was a place where the winds are typically very calm. They later discovered it's the place where eels go to mate, reproduce, and swim back to the rivers. Those freshwater eels, they go out in the middle of the Atlantic, they mate, and they swim back. It's a place filled with seaweed. It's called sargassum, seaweed. And... Um, uh, ships got caught there, there'd be no wind, and they would be calmed. And they called it the doldrums because the sailors, in the constant sitting on the ship, no fluttering in the wind in the sails, in the heat and the sweltering there of the equatorial Atlantic, they would become over, overcome with depression. And sometimes these ships... Uh, you're glad when you're not in a storm, but it's almost as bad to be, be calmed. You're just sitting there waiting. You can't row these big ships very far. I remember in my little sailboat, I'd get out in Biscayne Bay, and all of a sudden the wind would go calm. And I'd pull out the centerboard and try to paddle, or I'd take my sail with my hand. I'd go like that, and just you could wave your way through the water a little bit to try to just move. You're just stuck out there in the middle, no motor. And so they were having much difficulty, it says, slowly many days. Now what's happening? There is a season to sail, and there's a season when you get to a certain point where it's not safe to sail. And they started this trip a little late, and it was going longer and longer. And uh, Paul, who had a lot of experience in this, um, well, he's getting ready to give him some advice. Passing uh, a shelter of, of Crete off Salome, with difficulty, I means slowly, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lassia. Now they should have stayed at Fair Havens. But when much time had been spent, they'd wasted so much time going slowly, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was over. They typically thought that once the fall fast, a Jewish holiday was over, that was the time when you avoided sailing. They just used it as a benchmark. It's like farmers say, you know, after your last frost, you then plant your tomatoes or your corn. After the fast, they said, don't sail. And um, the fast was passed, and they said, uh, we shouldn't be sailing. Paul advised them. Now, Paul is telling the sailors and the owner of the ship, men, I perceive... Now, what right does he have to say anything? He's a prisoner. But you know what? He's gained so much respect. Paul had several private audiences with the king's of uh, Jerusalem and Israel when he was down there. Now he's on his way. He's appealed to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. Not all the prisoners on the boat. Some were just slaves that were being tried. Paul has a little more prestige. He's got Luke traveling with him. That really helps if you're going to go through a storm if you have some friends. 
You notice it says in Acts 27, 3, the next day we landed. What does that mean? Luke's traveling with him, so he's not alone. You go to verse 7 and 8, when we had sailed slowly many days. So he's, he's got some friends. So Paul is giving advice to the master, and he said, uh, I perceive this voyage will end in a disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. He said, you're going to risk our lives if you sail now. It's too late in the season. But they didn't want to listen to Paul. Now, how much did Paul know about sailing? Someone's going to read a verse for me. I think someone here has 2 Corinthians. There's a chapter 11, verse 25. Are we ready for that? Oh, they're going to they're gonna get you ready. Go ahead, read that for us. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You know what makes a, um, a stunt driver a good stunt driver? A lot of wrecks. And Paul understood something about sailing, didn't he? Shipwreck three times. How many people can brag about that? That's like, would you want to fly with a pilot that says, I've crash landed three times? <laughs> but he knew something about it. He wasn't the pilot of those ships that wrecked. He knew something about sailing. And so when he said, look, I, I, I wasn't born in Jerusalem. I was born in Tarsus. I've sailed across the Mediterranean many times. And I'm telling you, this is a dangerous time to sail. And um, they didn't listen. They thought more. They listened more to the shipmaster. They were thinking more about finances. And uh, they got into a bad storm. You jumped down. Well, let me see. I want to read a little bit of this. It said, um, yeah, go down to verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman, the pilot, and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised, they said, look, if we're going to have to spend months waiting for the winter, it says the majority advised that they try to reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening towards the southwest and the northwest and winter there. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, they said, look, it's a, it's a good wind. Let's, let's take out. It looked good at first. Soft wind. But not long afterward, a tempestuous headwind arose that had a name. It's called Eurocladin. So it's based on the name, same name as Europe. And so when the ship was caught and they could not head into the wind, they let her drive. They, sometimes you try to tack back and forth when you're sailing, but they just had to drive before the wind. You couldn't go cross wind into the waves. You get capsized. They weren't going where they wanted to go. They're just trying to survive. And running under the shelter of an island. Now, when you're in a big storm, if you can get between the storm and an island, you get a little break in the wind. And while they're blowing, the wind subsided a little bit because they had the protection of a Greek island. They've all got little mountains in the Greek islands. And so they start trying to secure and tighten up the ship. It says, we went by this island called Claudia. We secured the skiff. They had to get the little lifeboat that they were dragging behind it. They had to tie it on the boat. Now that skiff, that little lifeboat comes up lately, later in the story. When they'd taken it on board, they had hoisted it up on board and they had to tie it down. They used cables to undergird the ship. They're just trying to keep the ship together. They're tying it with very strong ropes. Fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis Sands, they're now drifting towards a place where they knew it was shallow and they were going to wreck. They struck sail. They got the sail to pull away from the island and they were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, sounds a little bit like the story of Jonah. The next day they lightened the ship. Now what does that mean? They start throwing things overboard. Now they're not throwing overboard the ballast. These ancient ships often had stones they would take on board. They'd put in the very bottom of the keel to try to keep it from capsizing. And uh, they're throwing over the valuables. And then on the third day, we threw the ship's tackling overboard. You know what the tackling is? It's the ropes and the gears that you need for operating the ship. But they had extra ropes and gears in case they lost stuff. They said, look, we've got to unload everything. Now, how serious does it sound their condition is getting? You remember the story of Jonah? And the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man to his God, and they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten them. They're transporting these valuables ostensibly to make money. 
they're, really, they're willing to throw everything overboard that they might be saved. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? I heard about a ship called the California. They, by the way, have rediscovered the California, the wreck. And they were coming back from South America and they had a lot of gold on board and some were prospectors that had gold. And when they realized the ship was sinking and they were trying to transfer to another ship, some people jumped into the water with their gold. Now what do you think happened? <laughs> that was really dumb. And they just went down like an anchor. They, by the way, they have rediscovered, I mentioned the California, the wreck of the California, and they found like billions of dollars, multiple millions of dollars of gold. Um, that's a whole interesting story right there. But notice when we jump here in verse uh, 20. Now when neither sun or stars appeared for many days and no small tempest, you, you know how Luke, Luke has that wording he uses. He says, there was no small stir among the soldiers what had become of Peter. No small tempest. Now what does that mean? A very big stir and a very big tempest. That was a, a phrase that Luke is uh, the only one who uses. No small tempest. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Well, you know, the Bible says where there's life, there's hope. So if you're alive, don't give up hope. Amen? So what's the condition of most of the people on the ship? Hopeless. They think they're doomed. Why are they especially sad? They saw no sun or moon or stars. Why was that important? How did they navigate where they were back then? GPS? Smartphone? Compass? Compasses were pretty primitive back then. The main way they figured out where they were was by looking up. They would hope they'd have a few days where they could fix a position based on the stars and the moon or the sun, but they couldn't get a reading of where they were, which means you're blowing around in the storm. You don't know when you're going to go crashing on the rocks. Mediterranean is surrounded by coastline. It's got islands. They figured we're just going to wreck and, and we're going to die. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood up in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Don't you love people that say, I told you so? You who are parents, have you ever told your kids, I told you? He said, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. How can he say that? For there stood by me this night an angel from God to whom I belong and who I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. <laughs> Paul, you getting to Rome is so important, I'm going to save the whole ship. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all of those who sail with you. Now, how much time had Paul spent with these, these other prisoners? You're talking about weeks and months. They've been making their way up the coast, stopping, trading, loading, unloading, and they're, you know, he, he gets to know these people. He loves them. He's praying. He's interceding for these people. Paul's not worried about him. He knows he's going to make it because God said, you've got to go to Rome. He's already been shipwrecked several times. He knows he's going to make it, but he's not praying about the others. He knew that there was a disaster, a shipwreck coming. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you those who sail with you. Why did he say granted you? Because Paul was on that ship as an intercessor. When we're surrounded by unbelievers and they're going through a trial, is that an opportunity for us to be intercessors? Have you also noticed that when people are going through a storm, they're more ready to listen to you than they are when everything's going great? It's so hard witnessing to atheists when they're happy. But when they're going through a trial, they'll listen. I've got some friends that um, I know. I won't say much else about it. And uh, I try to witness to them a little bit, and they kind of blow me off. They're pagans. But then when they go through a real trial, I've got uh, one friend in particular going through a real trial, I said, I'd like to pray for you. Oh, boy, they are happy to have you pray. It's amazing how a storm gets your attention. So, they're going along in a storm, and uh, 
Paul then tells them, God has granted me those. You go down to verse 25. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God. He starts out by rebuking them. You should have listened. But then he encourages them. Take heart. I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. You know, if you're going to witness to your friends, first you must rebuke and then you must comfort. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is a rebuke for sin. Kingdom of heaven at hand is hope that you can be there. You can be forgiven. And so the message of the gospel is you are a sinner, but good news, Jesus is a savior, right? So that's the message that he gives him. And he says, take heart, I believe God. It will be just as he told me. However, I got a little bad news. You want the good news or the bad news? You're going to live. Bad news. We're going to wreck. <laughs> and it goes on and says, they did not see any, anything for 14 days. Now, as you read through Acts 27, 28, you're going to notice that the number seven, or derivative of seven, comes up three times. And I think there's some spiritual meaning in this story. <clears throat> Let me give you something to think about. Here you've got a shipload of prisoners on their way to judgment before a king. We are prisoners that are on our way to judgment. On our way, God puts one of his messengers on the boat. Uh, he's got an appointment with the king too. And he is an intercessor. Paul in this story does a lot of the things that Christ does. He is interceding for them. He's a messenger of hope. He says he saw the angel of the Lord. Now, as we read along here, uh, you go to verse 29. It tells us that as they, they get further along, let um, me see here. Now, on the 14th day, verse 27, on the 14th day, night rather, had come, we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. They're just, they don't know where they are. About midnight, the sailors sensed they were drawing near some land. They heard the crashing of waves off in the distance. And they took soundings. You know what that means? They had these ropes that had knots tied on them. You ever wonder how they figure the speed of a boat by knots? They toss out a rope that had a weight. And based on how quickly the knots went out, they could determine their speed. As the rope was pulled out, there was a weight that had a big bulky thing on it so that it, it got pulled out at the consistent speed and they would measure their knots. They had also measure fathoms, how deep the water was by tossing out another rope with fathoms knotted off on it. And they, it, you could feel the rope going down very quickly. When the weight hit the bottom, it would go slack. And they could count how many fathoms it was on the rope and they'd pull it in. Then they'd throw it out a little later and it would be more shallow. They'd go, oh, oh we're getting, it's getting shallower. We're heading towards land. And so they're taking soundings to find out this, man, we don't want to wreck on the shore. It's night. We can't see. We don't know where to land the boat. And so you get a little picture of what's going on here. They saw 20 fathoms. They went a little farther. They, they took soundings and found to be 15 fathoms. What does that mean? Does God give us prophecies to show us where we are in history? You take fathoms every now and then. <laughs> you got to look around. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern, called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and prayed for the day. Someone's going to read another verse for me. And Revelation. Revelation 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. That tells us of a time where a tribulation is coming, but these angels, like those cables in the ship, they're holding back the disaster, waiting. And so uh, I'm not trying to draw a theological connection. I guess I'm making a little connection. A uh, four in the Bible sometimes represents something universal. Those four anchors that are holding the ship. It made me think of the four angels holding back the winds of strife, protecting until the, those lines are going to get cut and that ship is going to end up trying to make for shore, and it wrecks. <laughs> when those angels release their grip, time of trouble comes. Amen? And so they, they wait for the day. Their whole is um, fearing we should hit. They dropped four anchors from the stir and prayed for the day to come. 
Now the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship. They said, look, you know what, we, we better get off this boat now because it's not going to end well. And they let down the skiff. The skiff is the little lifeboat, right? Under pretense, they're pretending that they're doing something in the back. Paul knows what's going on. He said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Why did he say that? The soldiers take orders from Paul. They cut away the ropes and they let it fall off. Isn't it interesting? Paul has gone from captor to captain. He starts out in this voyage as a captive and he ends up the captain. And he's telling the soldiers what to do. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them to take food, saying, Today's the 14th day. Notice that number again. You've waited and continued without food, eaten nothing. They were probably weak. Therefore, some were seasick. Therefore, I urge you, take nourishment, for this is for your survival. Do we need to store up and eat before we enter the time of trouble? We need to feed our souls. Commit the word of God to our minds. Take nourishment. This is for your survival. Notice the, the beautiful um, combination of the practical with the spiritual. Paul says, I prayed, but we need to do practical things too. Now, why did Paul tell the sailors, cut, cut away the ropes lest, he told the soldiers, cut away the ropes so the sailors don't escape in the lifeboat. Nobody's really saved by the lifeboat that we know of. I think that ship is something like God's church. And, you know, it, there's a temptation to fragment as we near the end. And he says, we need to stick together if we're going to make, unless these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Isn't that interesting? They said, you got to make it a point to keep us together, he tells the centurion. And uh, so I think that it's just a, an interesting appeal here for unity, which is our study next month. So they took bread. Paul gives thanks. Look how he's leading out and everything. In the presence of them all, when he broke bread, does Jesus do that? Just near the end of his life, he breaks bread. They took it, they were all encouraged by the bread. They took food for themselves, and there were 276 persons on the ship. When we had eaten enough, they finally throw out the wheat into the sea. Now they've got to survive on what's in their stomachs. Have you ever thought near the end of time you might have to survive based on what you've remembered of the Word of God? You might get thrown in jail for your faith, and they may not give you a Bible. What's going to sustain you? You need to rehearse the verses that you've memorized. Thy word I have hidden in my nightstand that I might not sin against thee. Thy word I have hidden on my smartphone that I might not sin against thee. What does it say? Thy word I have hidden in my heart. We need to have some stored away here. I've thought before if I got thrown in jail for my faith, I would try to get a piece of paper and a pencil and write out as much of the word of God as I could so I can remember the promises. Amen? Amen. All right. So finally... When the day comes up, they hoist the mainsail. They make for land, but the ship runs aground. The prow, the bow is stuck fast, remains immovable, but the stern being broken up by the violence of the waves that were coming in, and the ship is creaking and falling apart. The soldiers were planning to kill the prisoners lest any of them should escape. You know why? Because a Roman soldier, if you lost a prisoner, it was your life for their life. You remember when the jailer thought that Paul had escaped, he was going to kill himself? You remember what happened when Peter escaped from prison? Herod killed the soldiers. So, lest any of the prisoners escape, they're going to kill all of them, but the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose. Why is everyone on the ship saved? For Paul's sake. Why are we saved? For Christ's sake. Amen? Amen. And he says, look, Grab what you can. The ship is breaking up. Grab little pieces of it and swim for shore. Is our church going to be able to survive in the last days as an outward organization? I think when the end comes, people are going to have to head for the hills and we're going to be persecuted and we're going to just gather in little groups and survive as we can meet together. Isn't that right? So there'll be a time when the ship busts up and we'll grab whatever pieces of the ship we can and you had two or three people grabbing a piece of this floating debris and a piece of this floating wood and they all paddled for shore. And so that's probably going to happen near the end of time. Interesting, the book of Acts kind of ends with this storm at sea. 
All right, so finally, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but observed a bay with a beach. I already mentioned that. So they, um, and here's a wonderful part of this story. It said, uh, and the rest on boards and some on parts of the ship, and so it was they all escaped safely to land. Now, didn't Paul promise that not a hair of your head will fail? What are those prisoners and soldiers and the captain starting to think about Paul? Everything he says happens. He's good to keep around. Now they come to the island called Malta, and the natives showed us no unusual kindness. They were very sympathetic and kind. I've been on the island of Malta. It's been many years ago. And they kindled a fire, and they made us welcome. Because of the rain was falling, and because of the cold, but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, out of all the soldiers and all the prisoners, who's out helping with practical things? Was Paul the kind of pastor that said, okay, you here do this, you here do that, or did he get in there and do it? Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, and the vipers that may have been dormant because of the cool as they warmed from the fire came out, and because of the heat, and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, because it had bit and it was still there, and it's venomous, its fangs are in there, they thought, he shook the, they thought, uh, no doubt this man is a murderer. Somehow, how you know, tragic, a Greek tragedy. He survived the storm, but he's guilty, and so he dies from the snake. Justice does not allow him to live, but he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Now, what does Jesus say about that? Does the Lord say, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them? Amen? So, now they've gone from thinking that he's a criminal to thinking that he's a god. They looked for a long time and no harm came to him. They changed their minds and said he was a god. <laughs> you know, that just tells you people's opinion. They go from thinking he's a devil to thinking he's a god in just a few minutes. Now, does the Bible say something about the serpent might wound you, but he will not stop you? Serpent's a symbol for the devil, right? And it says that in that region there was a state of a leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. And Paul went to him and he prayed and he laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases came and they were healed. And they honored us in many ways. Now, someone, you're going to read for me um, Acts 14, verse 3. You got that? Acts 14, 3. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. All right, and why does God allow Paul to heal this man? Acts 4, 29. Now, Lord, look on their hearts, look on their threats, and grant to your servants that with all boldness we might speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Why? Bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders. Why, why did Jesus do the healing? Why did the apostles do the healing? That they would then listen to the word, and they would see. <clears throat> I think you're going to see more of that again in the last days. Now everybody in the island bring their sick to Paul. What does it say? Oh no, he could only heal one man. No, they're all healed. This, the signs and wonders were being done by them again. And um, all right, now they finally, they have to go on to Rome. And I've only got a couple minutes to get them there. When they finally have to leave, they treat them very well. And... Um, he appeals and he goes to Caesar. Let me see here. When he gets uh, there, it says, Paul calls the leaders of the Jews together. He said to the Jew first, after the Gentile. And he said, The men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they'd examined me, wanted to let me go, the Romans, but because there was no cause for putting me to death. 
But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I'd done anything for which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I've called you to see you, that I might speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Then they said to him, We haven't heard any letters or anything about this. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, Christians, we know that it's spoken against everywhere. So when they had appointed a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom, now when he got to Rome, they gave him his own house he could live in, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Now Paul had lived for this day. This is part of the reason that he went to Rome. He's later going to talk to Caesar. He's going to talk to Romans, but he wanted to talk to his people there. He, wherever Paul went, he first went to the synagogue. He went to his own. They already had the background. Then he went to uh, the, the Romans as well. From morning till evening, he had quite a Bible study. And some were persuaded by the things that were spoken, and some disbelieved. That's the way it's going to be. If you witness for Christ, will everyone agree? No. Some will believe, though, and you get excited about that. So they didn't agree among themselves. They departed. After Paul has said this word, he said, go speak to this people. Hearing they'll hear and not understand. Go to verse 28. Therefore let it be known to you that salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jew departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Some believed, some did not. Then Paul dwelt two whole years. He is waiting for his trial date. In his own rented house, and he received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And that's where the book of Acts ends. And I got two seconds left. One, zero. Praise the Lord, we made it. We got him to Paul. He had waited for that day when he could, get to, uh, he could get to Rome and he could preach about Jesus. And God provided, he's in his own house. He can't travel ab abroad, but people can come to him. So he's got like his own church home. He's got his own pulpit in this home. He's got freedom. And he's not living, you know, in a dungeon where it's, t it's terrible. But there is a Roman soldier probably assigned to guard him. And as they rotate through the different Roman soldiers, they all converted. Whenever Paul has a Roman soldier, he converts them. Then they go among the troops and they start preaching. Then they go to Herod's or to Pilate or Caesar's household and they're preaching there. And eventually the servants in Caesar's household hear the gospel. And so Paul, through his influence in this big city, he actually has an influence that goes everywhere. Well, I enjoy the book of Acts. How about you? All right, God bless you, friends. I want to tell you we're out of time, but we do have a free offer if you missed it. It's called Dangers of a Deluded Gospel. And it's a message I share. I think it's got an important message about diluting the gospel. And we'll send it to you. If you ask, you can call 866-788-3966. Ask for offer number 829. And you can even download this message for free. If you want to download it, you just type in your phone or your device SH105 and type it to 40544 to get your free digital download. Listen and then pass it on to a friend. We're going to have our closing prayer here and then our mission offering. We want to say God bless to those that are watching. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With over 700,000 words contained in 66 books, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. To get biblical, straightforward answers, call into Bible Answers Live, a live nationwide call-in radio program where you can talk to Pastor Doug Batchelor and ask him your most difficult Bible questions. For times and stations in your area or to listen to answers online, visit bal.amazingfacts.org. Friends, have you ever heard of the bowhead whale? This enormous leviathan is the second largest creature in the world. Dark and stocky, it roams the fertile Arctic northern waters. These massive creatures can be more than 65 feet long and weigh more than 75 tons. That's heavier than the space shuttle. Yet in spite of their titanic size, they're able to leap entirely out of the water. Can you say belly flop? The bowhead whale gets its name from its bow-shaped skull 
and they've got one ginormous noggin. Matter of fact, their heads are about 40% of their body size, which comes in handy when you find out how they use their heads. They've got very thick skulls. Sometimes they get trapped under the surface and they use their heads to ram the ice. They can break a breathing hole in the ice that is a foot and a half thick. Friends, you have to just imagine what it would be like to be walking around on the Arctic ice and all of a sudden have the ground beneath you crack and split and rise as one of these sea monsters pushes its head up to breathe for the first time in 90 minutes. Because bowheads make their home in the coldest part of our world, they have the thickest blubber of any whale. But this, plus their friendly and curious nature, made them prime targets when the European whalers discovered the bowheads. They hunted them nearly to extinction. Fortunately, because of conservation efforts, we've slowly seen their numbers begin to increase since the 60s. One of the most amazing facts about the bowhead whale is its longevity. Scientists have discovered by evaluating harpoon tips found in their skull and examining their eye tissue, there are bowhead whales out there that are probably over 200 years old. You realize that means there are bowhead whales swimming the oceans right now that were alive before Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Can you imagine that? Among the other amazing mega facts about the bowhead whale is its mega mouth. They have the largest mouth of any in the animal kingdom. And when they open their pie hole full extended, it's large enough to park a medium-sized SUV inside. Yet in spite of the fact they've got such big mouths, they survive by eating the very smallest creatures in the ocean, plankton, krill, and other microscopic animals. Friends, I'm always amazed by the creatures God has made. This bowhead whale is able to dive to the deepest oceans. They can break through the ice and move mountains with their head and completely leave the water and fly through the air. And yet they do all that by gaining strength from almost microscopic organisms. Helps us remember that we survive through the little promises in God's Word. Jesus, when tempted by the devil, he quoted just a few little verses and he sent the enemy running. You can also have that same durability and long life as the bowhead whale by trusting in God's Word and his promises. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters. Enhance your knowledge of the Bible and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit the amazing Bible timeline at BibleHistory.com. We're here on the beautiful coast of the island of Puerto Rico. And if you were to travel east about 2,000 miles, of course, you'd be out in the middle of the ocean. But you'd also be in the middle of a mystical sea called the Saragasso Sea. It gets its name because of this common brown seaweed that can be found floating in vast mats. The area of the Saragosso Sea is about 700 miles wide and 2,000 miles long. Now the seaweed itself is fascinating stuff. It was first observed and called gulf weed by Christopher Columbus. It gets the name sargum from the Portuguese. Some people use it as herbal remedies. But out in the middle of the Saragosso Sea, the water is some of the bluest in the world. It's there you can see 200 feet deep in places. It also has a great biodiversity and ecosystem that surrounds the Saragosso Sea. For years, scientists wondered where the American and the Atlantic eels were breeding. They knew the adult eels swam down the rivers out into the Atlantic, but they never could find the place where they reproduced. Finally, they discovered it was out in the middle of the Saragosso Sea. So it's a fascinating place, but if you were an ancient sailor, you did not want to get stuck there. Being caught in the doldrums was extremely difficult for the ancient sailors. Of course, their boats were driven by wind and sail, and they'd be caught in the vast mats of the seaweed that would wrap around their rudder, barnacles would begin to grow. It's an area that is notorious for light and baffling winds, and so they'd make no progress. They'd get stuck. The men would become extremely dispirited. 
Sometimes violence and even insanity would break out as people were trapped in the doldrums. Well, friends, perhaps sometimes you felt that you're trapped in the doldrums. You've gone through episodes of depression. You feel like you're going in circles. Life seems stifling. You know, the Bible offers good news. There is a way out. The Bible talks about a famous character that was trapped in a cycle of depression. He was low as you could be. Matter of fact, he even had seaweed wrapped around his head. His name was Jonah. But God gave him a way of escape. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 3 through 7, we read, For you cast me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All of your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. You know, friends, the way that Jonah got out of his discouraging circumstances, he turned to God and he prayed. And if God could hear Jonah's prayer, just think about it. He was as far away from God as anybody could be. He was in the belly of a sea monster in the bottom of the ocean in the dark, yet he turned to God and God heard his prayer. You know, these ancient sailors, when they were trapped on the deck of a ship for weeks, stuck in the doldrums, discouraged, sometimes they would have a prayer meeting and pray that God would send a breeze that would set them free and get their boats moving. They turned to God in prayer and often miracles would happen and the wind would flutter in the sails and bring them out of their seaweed prison. Friends, maybe you have been stuck in the doldrums. Maybe you've been caught in a cycle of depression. If God can do it for Jonah, if he can do it for the ancient sailors, he can do it for you. Turn to the Lord in prayer. Trust his spirit to blow through your soul and to set you free.